Okay, welcome to Coffee and Conversation. This is our first uh, Coffee and Conversation live. I'm Lara Stein. I am the founder of Please Learning and a former classroom teacher and literacy coach um, in New York City. Uh, Nora. I'm Nora and I am a tutor at Please, but I'm also so a student support coordinator in the Bronx and have been teaching um, for nine years in New York City. Cheers to our first coffee and conversation. Cheers. Cheers. Good morning, everyone. So we have had a lot on our mind. This has been a really strange school year um, already. And uh, Nora and I have been talking a lot about what are things that are affecting educators and particularly families? And one of those things has uh, been a struggle getting our kids to, you know, independently work. We're, we've got parents that are working and they don't always have somebody next to them who can be sitting next to them or they've got children. So one thing we've been thinking about is how to build that independence. And another thing we've been thinking about or, you know, really, how can we make this a successful year for everybody? And so one way we want to do that is with structures and routines. So the two main things we're going to be talking about today is setting up those structures and routines so that we can have a successful e-learning year and building independence for our students, so we, for our children, so we don't have to sit with them all day long. And what's super unique about both these topics is like, you know, I can come from it from the ed educator perspective. I see what it's like for my kids and what, you know, how it's impact on families, whether it's in school or through tutoring. And Lara not only is a teacher, but a mom. So like she sees it from a lot too. So we really spent the last couple of weeks talking to everybody we know, whether they're a parent or a sibling or a teacher and really thought about like, these are the things that make surviving this really bizarre year super hard. And so we were like, okay, there has to be some tips that we can give that hopefully are not, you know, super hard to do, but can make surviving this a little bit easier. So we really hope that at the end of this, take away something that they're like, okay, yeah, I never thought about that. Or like, oh, wow. Yeah. Like we can do this. <laughs> this is okay. Yeah. So that's definitely our goal. Definitely. So let's start with, uh, let's get into structures and routines. And Nora, why don't you talk a little bit about what you would do if you were in the classroom? Totally. So I think this is something that we all kind of forget once we're home is that if we were in a school building, something that parents may not always know is that the first six weeks of school is literally dedicated to just building your classroom community. And by that, it means like, what are the routines in place? Like, how do kids unpack when they come into the school classroom? How do kids, you know, get their materials out for writing workshop or reading workshop or any period of the day? So much is spent on just building those routines and structures so that when it's time to really get to the nitty gritty of work, everything else is already set up and in place and there's a system. And so because we don't have those six weeks and teachers are on a computer, it's a little bit more challenging to bring those structures and routines into the home life because we're not in school. Um, so we think it's really, really, really important to just keep that in mind that if a child were in school, this is something that would literally be their whole day for the first six weeks to really, really build that. Um, and so with that in mind, I think something that we really wanna talk about that is like our first really big hot tip around building those structures and routines is having a consistent schedule. And I think scheduling as Silly as it may sound, because no one's really leaving the house, it's really like your golden ticket of how the flow of the day is going to go. It helps with consistency. It helps with stability. And kids know what to expect. And you, as the adult at home, also know what to expect, I'm going to say for sure. Definitely. So, I mean, I have to say we have four children in my house right now, not because I have four children, but we're also living with my in-laws. There are four children. It's really hard to keep the schedule of four children. Um, and there are different ways to do it. You know, some people have really fancy schedules. Some people have, are just writing it on a, you know, small sheet of paper. It doesn't matter. The idea is kids need a schedule. The Child Mind Institute talks a lot about, um, especially kids with attention and focusing issues, but 
really everybody having structure really helps kids. It gives them a sense of stability. And right now in this time, we need stability more than ever. Definitely. And having a schedule also helps children know what to expect of the day. And that is what is so important. So we can talk, you know, we can, we're going to show a couple of different schedules that it could look like. Um, it doesn't have to look like any of these in particular, you know, here we have a pretty fancy schedule, very visual. This, I would recommend visual for your younger kids. And then we have just like a handwritten, we have a handwritten one, which is also fine, but letting kids know exactly what is coming for the day on a day-to-day -day basis sets them up for success immediately. Totally. And it can be as low stakes as Lara said, as a piece of paper and a pen, or it can be as creative in an activity you can do together at home of like making your schedule cards of what is happening over the course of the day. Yeah. And just letting your kids know in the morning, here's what our, here's what this looks like. You know, here is another option. Nora um, showed this one to me as well. This is very teacher, teacher driven, and I, I love it. I love the visuals. It's true, and it's something that, like within a classroom setting, again, you would have a big schedule that you could refer to if kids are ever confused about what's happening next or what's to come. You simply point to the schedule. And what's really great about this one, and I think is something that we want to get into a little bit, is that having a schedule and routine is not just important for like what your academic day is going to look like at home, but it's also a way to build in the routines of like what you want in your morning and what you want in your afternoon or evening time for your child. Because I know for a lot of us from March till the end of the school year, it was go on Zoom in pajamas. And if you brush your teeth, you were super lucky. But I think going into the school year, a goal that I think a lot of people have is trying to rebuild in those routines. And even though we're home, like you can still get dressed to go on Zoom and you can still brush your teeth in the morning and rebuilding slowly that schedule that we would have had as if we were to leave our houses is really important. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. Uh, you once told me, uh, what'd you say? Messy, messy head, messy bed, messy head. Messy bed, messy head. It's so true. If you think about it, if your bed, when you come in is like all disheveled and everything is everywhere, you, you can't think, it's not clear. Your, your mind space is not clear, but by taking the 10 seconds to make the bed, you're allowing that clear space to kind of come in so that you can focus. So I always like to think about that. Messy bed, messy head, make the bed, your head's clear for the day. Yeah, I think that's really nice. You know, I also, you're gonna hear me say this a lot, um, in life, but I think the most important thing is consistency. I think right now we're building these routines and it's hard to manage, but ultimately it's, it really sets the kids up for success. So what I do, um, is I put together the schedule the night before so that when my kids wake up in the morning, it's all ready to go. And I run through it with them really fast. Um, and you know, they know what to expect. That's a great tip too, because then it means you're not running around in the morning trying to write four different schedules out. You've done it the night before, so you can actually sip and enjoy your coffee for a second. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm doing it at around one o'clock in the morning, but it doesn't matter. That's the time that I have to myself. So I set them up and consist, again, consistency is key. Keep it up because the, the, at first you might feel like it's not working, but the longer you do it, and you think to yourself, this is one thing I'm going to make sure I do. I am going to commit to setting up a schedule that will help you with the success. Don't give up after a week. If you give up, your kids will give up, but they will take your lead. If you keep it going and they feel, they see that structure every day, that's great. And if you have a kid who has a difficult time with changes, talk to them about a change in the schedule. If you, there is something that is atypical in that day, let them know it's coming. That's really helpful for a kid who has difficulty with change. Um, sure. so that would be, you know, something else to, to think about. And again, something we would do if we were in school is preview that change, why the change is happening, letting the child ask questions about the change so that when it happens, it doesn't feel like this big eruption to the day. Exactly. So, you know, I think that leads into really nicely the learning space that we want our kids to have. And I, and I feel like this has been a hot topic um, 
around, you know, homeschooling anyway, something that I would tell families, um, if when some of them were talking to me about, I think we might do pods. How can we, what do you think about this? Oh, we're just going to be on my child. What, where do you think we should work? And there are so many options with learning spaces. And, you know, we, I, I live in New York city, so we have, you know, a small apartment, but part-time we go to New Jersey. So if you're in a house, you, one thing you can do is convert your garage. Um, and what I had recommended to a lot of families who had a garage was turn it into a little classroom environment as best you can so that your kids feel like you, they are going somewhere. If there are other kids joining you, we keep the window, you know, we keep the garage door open. You can get a heat lamp for the winter, um, but not everybody has a garage. So that is one option, but it doesn't really matter. The you need a space that is just for your child to have somewhere to go to that is an organized, clean space where that schedule is up in front of them so they know what to expect. It is theirs. They have the materials that they need um, in front of them. I think it also just allows a child to have a sense of like privacy of like, oh, this is my space to learn. It's not you know, on my bed, jumping up and down or all the other random places, places teachers might have seen kids on Zoom. But I think it really helps everyone take a second to focus because you know that this is a designated space that is here to help you learn. Yeah, no, absolutely. I would definitely recommend that um, the number one thing that I, I think is that kids should not be on their bed. When kids are on their bed, they're lying down, they're rolling around. I think the bed is, should be a separate space than their workspace. Um, I, I like to read in bed. I think that that for the independent work is a little different. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of different workspace uh, options. Oh. And what's great about this too, is it's so similar to the schedule where like, it can be as fancy and cool as a whole garage, or if you're like us who live in one bedroom, small apartments in New York City, it can be just a really small space or corner where, again, as Lara was saying, all the materials that I'm going to need as a child for my day are there and ready to go. I don't have to get up to go get something from a different space or a different room. And even if I have to share a space with siblings because they're also e-learning, there's a way to do it within a small space that still feels like, okay, this is my learning zone. Something like headphones goes a super long way or not facing the same direction, um, I think is super key too. So again, yeah, it can be as super big as a garage space or as small as just a little corner in your house that has like a designated chair and desk and whatever materials that the school provides or that you have to help have that space be successful. Yeah, I think that that's 100% right because we all know that there are tons of us, especially in New York City, there's, you know, we've got multiple kids in the area. Headphones is key for that. I mean, really making sure that we can keep as private as we can for this time so that our kids are completely focused um, on the, the class in front of them or even on the independent work. You know, um, that picture of the kids in the garage, those are actually my kids and they're doing their writing and I have um, calm music going on in that picture. So let's say your child is doing their independent work at their space and you have got a ton of kids around them, even putting on headphones and having some classical music so that it's blocking out the noise uh, of the kids around you can be a really helpful way to achieve, to achieve that privacy where you feel like, okay, I'm everybody else, everything's going on around me, but I really, I'm trying to tune it out and stay focused on my work. Definitely. And I think it's such a silly thing we forget, but it's also super easy is making sure the chargers for the electronics are in that learning space. Oh, great point. There are so many times where it's like, it's dying. What am I going to do? And they have to run around to go find it. So even just as something as like having the charger already there, kids are really great with technology. They can plug it in themselves. And it's like another way where they don't have to run around the house and get distracted by something too. 
such a great point. Yes, I didn't even think of that. That's great. I actually, I, that is the one thing that I am so guilty of is all of our devices are always running out of batteries. And so I'm rushing to bring, to grab the charger, to plug into the iPad. And now I'm going to keep my chargers in the space. That's a great point. And I bet they all could plug it in on their own too. So they can never say to you that it's dying because it's right there for them to use. Love that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, something else that has come up a lot um, has been resistance to get onto Zoom or resistance to do their independent work, and they really don't want to. And so another topic that we want to talk about today was autonomy and choice. Um, you'll hear me talk about Child Mind Institute all the time because I'm constantly on their website, constantly reading uh, their articles. And I just want to pull up a quote from one of their articles, which we are going to share on the resource uh, page, the resources that document that will be up on the website. Um, a lot of times defiance is about seeking control. We see more bids for control from kids when things seem uncertain and out of control like they do now. This can show up as an increased need for students to feel like they are in charge of their lives, and sometimes it leads to an uptick in pushing back against rules and expectations at school. When students are given a lot of commands, then they don't feel like they have autonomy. That's when they tend to rebel, especially older students. So I really loved this um, this article, actually, in general, but this quote in particular, because I think we do right now particularly see a lot of resistance um, from our kids. This is a very difficult time. It's an unstable time generally. This is not their norm. Um, and one thing that we can do is provide choice to them. Now, the choice might look like instead of saying, you have to do your reading right now, there's you know a demand, a command. Instead, you can say to them, you know, here's your choice. You can, you can do your reading or you can do your math work. Which do you choose? Or you can use a pen or you can use a marker. Which do you choose? The choices have to be something that you are okay with either way, but it's giving them a small piece of autonomy um, within that choice so that it's not completely, or it can be, you know, you can, well, I think those are pretty, pretty good. Um, and you were saying too, I think the consistency around the choices, like it's not something where, you know, if you give up after one week of, of giving choices where like, you know, you'll see success. It's something you really have to keep doing. And it's true because what it does is it's empowering a child to make a choice between two things, but then you as the adult are still also kind of holding the control and power of like, this is the choice you're making, but it's about a task in which you have to do right now. So. Yeah. I think it's exactly. definitely something with consistency and continuation, you're going to see a lot of success with. And kids also feel good about it because they're still getting a say at the end of the day and right. achieving what you want them to achieve. Right. And then praise them, praise them for, for, for making a choice and following through with it. And, and that's going to lead into our conversation really nicely about building independence and how we can build independent learners where we are not you know, sitting on top of our children while they're working all the time. I would say, and that's something like as a secret tip coming from an educator, we love this remote world in the sense that families get to really see what's going on, even though it's not the same as if we were in the classroom, but it's a way to hear more of what teachers are talking about in a way that would have normally never happened. But at the same time, I have families and parents at times that have a really hard time not sitting with a student when they're learning or engaging what's going on. And what's tricky about that is that sometimes then I as a teacher don't get a true sense of like what's hard for them or what's easy for them because they might have mom and dad helping them in their ear or feeding them answers. And as much as we wanted to be a collaborative experience, I as the teacher still, despite the screen, wanna be able to get a sense of like, okay, this is a strength and this is an area of growth. So. I think it's just a nice thing to keep in mind that like from a teacher side, we love the collaboration, but we also really want to see what our kids can do, even on a screen. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm just thinking as a parent, I remember as a teacher, I would say, 
let your kids struggle, let your kids fail. It's okay. And then uh, the second I became a parent and we would have to do tummy time uh, with our, my daughter, she would cry, she would fall. And immediately I'd pick her up. And I remember somebody was with me and they were like, you have to let her struggle. And I would think, oh, this is what, as a teacher, I would tell families, but as a parent, I can't do it. You know, it's so much harder to do it as a parent than as a teacher. And so it is something that we have to keep in mind as much as possible. Like, it's okay if they're frustrated. It's okay if they struggle. That's how they learn to persevere. So when we talk about building independence for learning, the first thing that I want everybody to keep in mind is as Nora was saying in the beginning of the session about how the first six weeks are about building routines and structures. The first six weeks is, is about building those structures to build independence. So kids have been at camp, well, actually this year, even more so than every other year, but every other year we have kids who have been, you know, had a relaxing, no structured summer and we have to bring them back into school mode. Now more, schools were shut down in March. So they've had even longer time without structure. So the first thing is they wouldn't, they're just learning about getting those structures and learning to be independent right now, no matter what grade they're in. And if you have a kindergartner, the first two months of school is about being a student. So I would also say if right now your child is not able to sit independently or is resisting, these are things that are very typical of classroom life right now. They are, For learning, sure. they are learning how to, especially kindergartners, they are learning how to be students. And right now they're learning how to be students out of the classroom. So this is a whole new realm, right? So and it's such a good point because it's true in the classroom during that time, like we let kids wander, we let kids find a good learning space for them. Yeah. There's a way to kind of monitor and watch and say, hmm, like Lara really maybe needs to walk around during a lesson because that's how she engages and that's how she focuses. Or I need to look out a window to be able to like really retain what's going on. And so it's hard because at first you may be like, but why, why can't Lara just sit still? Why is she not sitting? Or why is Nora looking out the window? But for some people, it's how they learn. And I think as, as adults, we know what works for us as learners, but for kids, we have this expectation of like, you sit down, you learn, you're listening, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're actually actively listening. There's a lot of ways that kids are learning and listening that doesn't look like just sitting down. And we have to kind of keep that in mind, even when we're at home. Right, we actually, in the classroom, a lot of classrooms have flexible seating um, and we let them figure out, um, you know, during math time, I like to lie on my stomach and do my math. During uh, reading time, I wanna sit on the beanbag chair. During writing, I like to stand up at my desk. So providing options within our learning space um, of, you know, how they best learn is okay. And if they're moving and they're fidgeting, that doesn't mean that they're not listening. You want to check in to make sure, you know, do you know what's going, like, what, what is the teacher asking you? Or can you, can, can you participate, raise your hands? But um, that doesn't mean that they're not listening if they're not sitting still. In fact, I used to sit still when I was, I remember being in fourth grade and I would sit still. I was a perfect angel. I didn't know what was going on. I wasn't listening. I was spacing out. So you could be sitting still and not listening at all. And you could be moving all around and hearing what's going on. It just depends on the child and the way. Right. And that's a hard thing to get comfortable with for, for parents and sometimes even for teachers because it doesn't necessarily look like what you think active learning means. Yeah. And I think that brings up a great point of like, so if I'm home, how do I know if my child is walking around that that means that they're listening? And Lara said it, but it's so true. Just ask a couple questions like, oh, did you hear what the teacher just said? What did they, what did they say? Or like, hmm, if you were to share, what would you say, share? Some, a couple of questions that just kind of gauge like as you're slowly trying to, you know, introduce independence that allow you to say, okay, Lara's walking around, but she's on it. Or, you know, Lara's walking around and maybe she's not really following what's going on. So I think allowing yourself that time to ask those questions. When you mean walking around, do you mean during the lesson? 
For sure. I mean, during the lesson, absolutely. I think there's times where kids in the classroom get up and they literally will do a job even. Like I had a student who would sweep the classroom during a mini lesson because that was a way that they could move their body and still hear what was going on. Um, it could even be that some kids pace or I had a student once who used to stretch in the back of the rug during the lesson because it was really hard for her to sit still for more than five minutes and as we're building up this stamina on zoom I think it's important that like we allow a little bit of that to see like number one how long how long does it really have to go on for and number two is that really what you need to learn mm, interesting okay um yeah I mean I think that you know as long as they're walking around sort of near the Zoom, I would feel more Sure, absolutely. Just because absolutely. it's not like in the classroom in that you can hear your teacher from all the way over there, but kind of within a area. Right, like I think a great example is if Lara's doing a read aloud and I'm someone that needs to kind of move my body, I can still sit here or be close by and standing and stretching. Right. And that's still okay because I could be following along with, with what's going on. So, you know, in those, I think that those are really uh, great suggestions um, in terms of once we have, you know, what to pay attention to, to allow the independence, uh, to allow the independence. And something I want us to also think about is how to get there, you know, how to, how to be okay with that. And, um, you know, the first thing that I want to really touch on there is behaviors, positive positive reinforcement of behaviors. You know, we tend to correct uh, misbehaviors. We tend to say, sit still, um, stop, don't move your hands, don't touch that, stay focused, right? And, and, and that's just not just with the Zoom, that's in life, right? We tend to, to, to go to what are they doing wrong? Because that's what we're noticing. Life passes us by when things are going well, we don't pay attention because that's our expectation. But in fact, children need, in order to strengthen what they're doing well, we need to give that our attention. So what I really want to talk about is how to um, give positive reinforcement to those behaviors. So even if you have a child who moves around the whole time and they're not listening, that, that they're the type of child who are moving and they're not listening, find the Try to ignore as much as possible um, to a degree that, you know, is not disruptive to the class, but try to find if they're even able for a second, a two minutes to sit and watch, give them a silent positive reinforcement, but strengthen that, that um, behavior by giving, you know, great job, great job. I'm so proud of you. Or in an immediate remind an immediate positive reinforcement or even after the class if they only spent two minutes in that whole class or they said one thing they raised their hand they said one thing right after the class you give them that positive reinforcement wow you asked a really thoughtful question um during that class that was really impressive i can't wait to see that again um rather than spending the majority of the time uh, on their misbehaviors because when you are spending a time on correcting them, you're strengthening the misbehaviors. If you're spending time on the positive, you're, you're strengthening the positive behaviors. Um, so I, I watched this Child Mind Institute um, talk one time, and they were saying that, you know, as a parent, we, we might be going along doing something and our kids are fighting and that's when we intervene. And that's when we said, that's when we go in and they're expecting us to intervene. Rather to strengthen the positive behaviors, you want to say, wow, you guys are playing so nicely. Or, uh, and then when they're arguing, let them try to work it out. That's where you ignore. And then after they've worked it out, praise again. Wow, wait, I'm really impressed that you were able to work through that together. So again, trying as much as possible to strengthen the positives by giving positive reinforcement. Lara, you once said something really funny to me about um, the amount of positive reinforcements or positive feedback before yeah. you give the negative. And I think it was really funny. Can you repeat it? <laughs> My husband says this to me. For every, um, for every negative, you have to give three attaboys for every 
corrected behaviors or something like that. He says something like that, but yeah, it was like, you got to have three attaboys. So as much as possible, giving the positive feedback, because we hear the negative. We don't hear the positive as much. We really internalize the negative and we want them to start internalizing the positive as well. Definitely. And I think that at times, you know, there are instances where despite the positive praise and despite, you know, trying to give all of that attention to that behavior, there still are those moments where it's not feeling super successful and it's still not feeling like the behavior you're seeking is happening and you're questioning why you're doing all of the things and, you know, if we were in a school building and we started to notice that with all the interventions in place, something that's really helpful at times is charts to kind of reinforce that positive behavior, that visual to see like, okay, I'm doing all the things I need to do in order to be successful, um, which is a really great tool to also have at home. Definitely. Let's, I, I do want to talk about the tools. Can we, for, before we talk about the tools, I do want to talk a little bit about the gradual release, yes. but I also want to say consistency is key for the positive reinforcement. You are not going to see success right away. This is not immediate. This is great. This is going to take time. You are building their stamina. So I, as you, the most important thing is to continue that positive praise. And even you're a lot of, a lot of us will say like, I do that. I do that. And I, and I think I do up it. No matter how good you are at it, up it. Right now is the time to do more, more positive. Find those quiet moments. Find those moments of he spent five minutes working on his writing. Amazing. You, you worked independently for five minutes. I am so amazed. You What was successful for you about that? Talk to them. What was successful for writing that, that um for those five minutes, because the goal is to continue to build and to strengthen. So no matter what, up it. That is the, because we are, you know, we all work really hard at giving our children praise. Have a specific thing to give them praise about. Don't just say you did a great job today. Be specific. You know, wow, you spent five minutes on your writing today. How did you do that? That was incredible. Tomorrow, do you think we can make the goal seven minutes? That's what we do in the classroom, right? We, we, we let them know how much time they've spent on something and what is our next goal. So, um, so that positive reinforcement, consistency, keep up with it. It's a lot of work right now. It will pay off in the end. Um, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about, we wanted to talk a little bit about the gradual release. What can we do? So that we're not sitting right on top of our kids the whole time, praising them the entire time, because we have things to do. We have jobs. We have errands. We're not all, we have other children. We, there's so much that we do not have time to sit on top of our children the entire day. Um, so, you know, and so basically what we want, what we mean by gradual release is we want to start with a lot of support and slowly pull away. Do you Definitely. want to? Well, I was just going to say to you, welcome to real Zoom life where you're. <laughs> yeah, I love it. You know, this is what happens. It's typical. Um, I was just going to add that since we're spending so much time in the beginning observing and seeing, you know, how kids are doing engagement wise, I think you can find those golden spots of like, oh, wow, like they're really into this. And those are the moments where like walk away. It's okay. If you see they're like super engaged, they really enjoy read aloud. They really enjoy the math problem yeah. of the day. Really watch for those, those moments of like, oh, okay, they're good. I, I can step aside for a little bit and then come back and, and you know, say that positive praise again, like you did it. Yeah, I think that that's a great point. You, you, you might not even be able to leave the room yet, right? But even if you could sit 10 feet away, even if you could sit across the room to get your own work done, something... I, I love that idea. Observe what is going well. Where are the areas in the day that you can say, okay, I don't have to be here. And then, oh, Nora, are you with me? Oh no. Oh, there you are. Okay. Here. Um, observe those parts of the day that are going really well that you can separate out a little bit and then find the ones that they need more of your support. Um, and then, you know, again, sit back, sit 10 feet away. You're, give them the silent gesture. Give them that silent positive feedback. Great job. So proud of you. Keep it up. Ten feet away. Tomorrow, 
or three days from now, further across the room. Think about what your goal is. Is your goal to be working on the other side of the room? Is your goal to be, you know, with another kid um, in a different room? Think about what your goal is and how are you going to slowly move away from sitting on top of your child where they can be a little bit more independent. Again, this is going to take time. We have to put in that positive reinforcement, that gradual release over time, we'll get there. And if we don't get there, right, with just moving away, we can always use tools. So, so this is really Nora's, you know, expertise area that I would love to hear more about. Um, but there are different tools that we can use to support our kids. Yeah, I think it's so important to keep in mind that again, whether we're home or in the classroom, like there are certain goals that we want to achieve for ourselves as learners. And I think those conversations are really important to have with kids, especially when it feels like a struggle. And so sitting down, reflecting like, you know, what is it that you are really wanting this school year? Like, do you want to be able to build your stamina and focus on the lesson for the duration of it? Do you want to be able to build your independent reading to a certain amount of time? There are tools and supports that we can put in place that, again, emphasize the positive praise and also really allow for a student to be reflective in their learning and really reinforce that like gradual release and building independence. So in school, we call them behavior charts, but I think there's lots of ways to reframe it so it doesn't feel like a punitive or negative thing. Um, and we have a bunch of examples to kind of just show you guys and talk through. Um, again, geared towards different learners, different systems that might work. So one example can be for a younger student like a superstar grader. So this was one I used in first grade. So a superstar first grader has three big goals, you know, and together collaboratively, even could be with the teacher on Zoom during like a mini conference of like, here are the three goals that really we really want to see. Um, it can be that like, my brain is on and focused during Zoom. Um, I ask for a break once and I participate two times during the lesson. And basically what you would do is fill out the same kind of schedule and routine like we talked about before your morning and your afternoon and after each activity or within you know your lunch break have a real conversation like how did that go like was it green like you did it that's awesome you met your three goals was it yellow or was like eh not you know you did it but you needed a couple of reminders or like red we, we need to work on this and that's okay if it's red um and i would really encourage having kids fill this out with you but really taking the lead of them they're really honest they're gonna know if it's green yellow or red and trust them and have that conversation about like okay so what can we do next time so that it's closer to a yellow or it's closer to a green um so this is one example that has been very helpful. And, you know, I think we are talking also about frustration and being upset. And this is a time of true uncertainty and real hardship for everybody. And, you know, now that we're not in school, it's hard to learn all those coping strategies for when you are frustrated and when you can be frustrated on Zoom. And I think giving and teaching in even at home those strategies is really helpful. And then it also leads more to the greens and yellows than it does to the reds. So when I get upset or confused or frustrated, I can, and you can say two things. So one can be as simple as like, you know, I raise my hand on Zoom in the chat or like I privately message the, message the teacher or I ask mom and dad for help. You know, a very easy, simple thing, but just really teaching kids how to do that successfully. And then at the same time, like when I get upset, I can't. So for instance, when I get upset, I can't, you know, throw the computer or like turn off Zoom or log off. And those are behaviors that like in these times, okay, because they happen, people are really going through it, but really trying to teach like, instead of having a negative behavior, there are strategies you can use um, to help. So definitely a little bit of social emotional learning in there. Another kind of example of a chart, again, is a daily chart. So very similar to the first one where you're listing out your schedule, your three goals are at the top. As we said before, visuals, especially for our young kids are key because you can give that little nonverbal like pointing to the goal and the visual and kids will know what you mean. You're giving a redirection of like, 
what behavior you want to see. And then similarly, filling it out at the end with them. Was it green smiley face? Was it yellow? Was it red? And something that helps sometimes. There are some kids that, you know, they just need the chart and that's it. They're cool. They're done. And then there are other kids that they need that little bit of motivation around something. And so you see the word rewards or I think prizes and people kind of panic because they're like, oh, well, I don't want to like give them something or a gift because, you know, they did a behavior that's expected. But when we say rewards or prizes, um, it's really motivation to achieve their goal. And it can be something that's not like a gift. It's not something you're going to go to the store. And these are rewards that you can build together and generate a lift. So common ones I like to give are like extra five minutes of reading time with mom or dad during my nighttime routine, or like an extra bubble bath during the week. Things that you already have and can do at home that don't cost anything, that really is like a simple, enjoyable thing. Um, and kids buy into it. They're super, super into it. And you can decide at home, like how many smiley faces do I need to get that reward? And um, it also helps to build the relationships, right? If you're, if you're doing, you know, an extra board game with mom and dad, I think that actually helps on both ends because right now, we also are so crazed and busy that we don't always feel like we're able to give our kids attention and they feel that too. So they're dying for our attention as well. So just to give a, a reward of some face-to-face -face time, um, you know, is, is huge for everybody. I, I, I think it was Child Mind Institute. I was hearing a talk and somebody said, a parent asked, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm working so hard. I don't even get to see my kids. And they said, just spend five dedicated minutes to your child where they are 100% the focus. They will feel it. You will feel it. Everybody will have, you know, essentially like fill your bucket. Um, and I think that these rewards are a great way to kind of help that out on both ends. Definitely. And the only one I would steer away from right now, because we're really trying to seek that connection to each other is like five more minutes of iPad time to play a game. I think we should really try to use this as like a moment to connect. Yeah. I'm going to show you the um, chart that I've been using with my nephew. Um, these are kind of ones that I've done at school as well. You'll notice Wednesday's missing and that's because that's the day he's in person in school. But um, I tend to not, I, I, lo I like that Nora has the uh, smiley face, the yellow, the red, because it's a discussion point. I've never used those. What I've always done is if they get it, if, they, if they've if they done really well, then they get a smiley face. And if they haven't done, you know, what the, their expect met their expectations, then there's no smiley face. Um, but what I really like about this one, again, is the visuals. Um, when I am sitting next to him, uh, I just point to the visuals. You know, if he is not following the direction, I just point to the follow direction. If he needs a reminder to raise a quiet hand, I just point to the quiet hand. I, as much as possible, I like to do silent gestures. Um, you know, if he's not listening, I just point to it. And then we have, um, we, we build up. So for his first week or his first two weeks of kindergarten, he had to have uh, three, three smiley faces, right? And he was getting four smiley faces. So we upped it. Um, so then at the bottom, we say, how many smiley faces does he have to earn a day? And I think now he's up to five smiley faces. Um, it's sort of like, I always liken it to when you're on Weight Watchers and I was on Weight Watchers at one point when I was like 16. And I remember they would say, you, the, the more weight you lose, the less food you get to eat. So you feel like it's a, it's an unfair thing, but it's like, it's the same way here. The more smiley faces you get, the more smiley faces you're going to have to get. Exactly. Um, so my sister-in-law is really amazing with this because she has been so consistent and she, every single Sunday night, she prints this out. We tape it to his desk and it is there for, you know, for the week and he is ready and he's prepared. Again, I cannot reiterate consistency is key. She has been so consistent with it and he has made so much progress already. Um, so I really think the use of behavior charts can be very successful for kids. And, and I were talking about how our behavior charts are 
a lot of them are for younger ages, right? Um, probably up until like fourth grade, you can use some of these. But when you get to fourth and older, smiley faces, stars, these are not things that um, older kids are going to respond to. But there are ways that we can um, have these behavior charts um, or po you know, positive reinforcement um, through these tools. And one way is to do point systems. Um, and we will have a uh, example of them on our website and our resources page. But, you know, older kids might respond to a point system. Again, I actually think that I heard this from Child Mind Institute and Nora had, you know, Nora, this is her specialty. So she had already known about the point systems, but where, you know, they earn a certain amount of points and then they can withdraw points for their reward. You know, so if it is, I know we don't want to do an extra 30 minutes of, uh, you know, 20 minutes of iPad time, but let's say it is, they can, you know, there are a certain amount of points will be for the withdrawal. Um, so you deposit points in. So, you know, they did their, in, they did their 30 minutes of reading, deposit 200 points. They did their, um, they joined Zoom independently without you being there, you know, drop in a hundred points. And once you have enough points, you also want to come up with what um, are these points going to be worth? How much is, you know, the extra 20 minutes of iPad time? How much is the game with mom? How much is, um, you know, cell phone time? I don't know. What, I don't You'll know. be surprised because what they'll do is they're going to start saving them because they realize the high value stuff worth more points. So they're just going to keep them. <laughs> right. And then you can withdraw the points, right? That's how you get, that's how you earn it. And so it's a, it's, you know, it's actually even probably reinforcing uh, this idea of like payment and, uh, you know, earning money, paying, even though it's points. So there are ways to do this for older kids as well, that it doesn't involve a smiley face or the visual. Definitely, definitely. As well. Um, and, you know, the, well, go ahead. I, I want you to keep talking about the visuals because they're, I mean, the tools, because, um, there are other ways to. There are. And I think something that feels super important too, in terms of whether you're, you know, building a positive reinforcement chart or other visuals that could be, these are some resources on Amazon that we're going to link to so that you have access to them, but ways that also, again, enforce independence, but are a visual reminder. So a visual clock timer, like you see um, with the red is basically like you set it for how long an activity is. And as the time goes on, the red starts to disappear till you get to zero. And at zero, it gives a very quiet little beep, beep, beep. But I think the concept of time sometimes is, is really challenging, especially on Zoom. And so even though kids may not understand five, 10, 15, 20, the five minute increment, they're seeing a visual that reminds them how much time is left, how much time has passed. And it's a nice little reminder of like, how far they've come and how much time is left without you having to say how much exactly. I think the other one too, which is really great is sand timers. Sand timers are awesome for independence because if you're like, I want you to do your independent reading now and you hand them a sand timer and say, flip it over when it's done, you're done. They don't necessarily know that at the top is how many increments of time there is. So you could hand them a 10 minute sand timer and not know, they're not gonna know that it's 10 minutes. And it gives them that independence to take the tool. They go into their learning space, they flip it over. And then when they're done, they get to say, I'm done. So just little ways, again, where you're gradually building independence, you're giving the tools to help them be successful during this time. I love these stand timers because also if they were taking a break, you could say, you could hand them the green one, which is the five minute one, you know, go, go take a break, turn it over, go, go stretch, go run around, do what you need to do. When the, sun, when the sand timer is done, come on back. Right, which I think is a great point that we like should just address super fast is the idea of breaks, you know, when as adults, like we get up and get to like, you know, go for a walk in the hallway or go use the bathroom or take a break on our own. And like, that's something that kids also need too. And we can build that into their schedule and preset it so that they're ready to go and use their break when they want. So in a school, it may look like, you know, a movement break where they do five minutes of gold noodle, but you can also do this at home and preset it onto kids' schedule. So this is like an example of a movement break pass where 
before the lesson starts, you can say like, okay, you're going to have two minutes during your academic blocks today and you can take X amount of breaks. So you might want to start with two just to see how that goes or one, depending on, you know, if someone's not as fidgety as the other. And then together, again, have that conversation of what is it that I can do during that movement break? I can get water, I can use the bathroom, I can stretch, I can draw, or I can go for a walk. I think, again, this helps with frustration tolerance, especially if Zoom is feeling challenging, or if I just need a second to move around because as adults, we have that luxury where we can just get up and go. And in school, we don't always have that. So we wanna build into that too. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, yeah, I think that that's a really great point. And it, and it actually makes me think about um, something else I wanted to touch upon, which is to help build that independence. Talk about, if, if especially if you have a child who is struggling to be independent um, during this time or you're um, working toward that gradual release, have a discussion before they're, a, a quick discussion before they're, sit, they're sitting down to their either independent work or their Zoom class and and have um talk about what success is going to look like for them so let's say you know um zach if you start to feel fidgety what can you do to make this successful for you um and you know you have to have tools in place for them to or strategies in place for them to be able to achieve it so maybe he has a fidget toy right so so he has a fidget toy or he's allowed to get up one time to go, you know, take a walk or he's allowed to go get a drink of water if he needs one. Um, set up, decide what are what are the things that we can do to reset myself uh, so that I'm successful here. So, OK, if I'm feeling fidgety, I might grab my fidget toy. I might stand up for a minute and do a little shake and then sit back down. I might walk away, but have that conversation so that you're talking about the predictable things that might happen and what they can do uh, to, to reset themselves. Um, I think that that's really uh, helped set up for success as well. And again, you're, it does feel like a lot. Um, you know, all of this feels like a lot, but you're front loading it. It's what we do in the classroom as well. It is a lot. Uh, but we're front loading it so that it sets the rest of the year up for success and our kids are able to do these things independently. Uh, when I was a classroom teacher, we used to spend the first week of school unpacking our bags and packing our bags and we would model and, and you know, and then one kid would do it and then a table would do it and then three tables would do it. Um, and that was because we had so many kids who would forget to unpack their bag and it was took time, it was time consuming in the beginning, but then we never had to do it again. And that is our goal here. It is still the beginning of the year. We have still have so much to the year. So even though school has started, that doesn't mean that we can't have, um, we can't have uh, a successful year. You know, for sure. And I know we totally have like front loaded all this information on everyone. And we're really excited because, you know, we want to do this with you. We're, we're in this together. You know, people always say the expression, like it takes a village, it takes a community. And it's really, really true. And, you know, we're just really thankful that we could start this conversation and really hope that together we can, you know, survive this really insane time. Yeah. There's we're so excited because we have so many great um, uh, coffee and conversations planned for the upcoming year. But before we sign off, we just want to pull up, you know, some some key takeaways from our conversation. The first is structure and routines. This is so important. We cannot stress this enough. Having these structures in place will set your child up for success having a visual schedule, no matter what it looks like, something that the kids can turn to. You know, if you want pictures, there are so, you can just Google visual schedules and pictures will pop up. You don't have to buy visual schedules, but you can. And we're gonna link um, a lot. We're gonna link them all to uh, our resource page that will be on the website. Um, a learning space, a spot for your child, no matter if it's a garage or a desk, or at the kitchen table, but something that your child consistently goes to every day um, for every, you know, learning session and autonomy and choice. You know, when we're coming up against resistance, 
give them choice. Don't always, it's not about always giving them a command, give them a choice within reason. Uh, and building independence, we do not wanna be sitting next to our children all day long, every day for the rest of the year. It is unrealistic and it is frustrating. So right now, put in the time, reinforce that positive behavior. Look for those moments that you are expecting them to that that are your expectations that you would normally ignore find those and give them positive reinforcement throw them a silent thumbs up at the end talk immediately reinforce that behavior at the end of the session at the end of their class at the end of the independent work wow that was so impressive i'm i can't i'm amazed that you were able to you know sit and write for that long be specific about that praise, not about them as a human being, but about the task at hand. Gradual release. That is another way we're gonna build independence. Think about what your ultimate goal is and start to move away. Observe the places where they are successful without you. And then in the places that they are not successful without you, start to move away. Set up a plan beforehand of what they can do uh, if they start to get fidgety so that they don't need to go to you and that you don't need to redirect them. And the last um, thing for building independence is having those visuals in place, like a behavior chart of some sort or a um, stand timer or a visual timer. Those are really nice tools um, as well to have in front of you because again, they you can leave them for that amount of time while they're following and if they don't and even if they only spend if they're sitting in front of that visual timer and they've spent five minutes of the 30 minutes reading you are going to compliment those five minutes because they need to hear what they've done successfully strengthen that behavior by giving it attention um so thank you so much for joining our coffee and conversation we are so excited that um, you're joining us and we can't wait. Um, Nora, do you want to just tell them what's coming up from Coffee and Conversation next? Yeah, so we have really been thinking again and listening and trying to get an ear on the ground of what we want to talk about. So one of the big things we are hearing a lot about is like, what do we do together to kind of like get off of a screen? What are some ways that we can you know, bond or even just, again, give our kids something to do that doesn't involve an iPad or doesn't involve a TV. So, you know, we're hoping to present you guys some resources that we found along the way in some of our future coffee and conversations of things that you can do. And just to give you a little, little bit of a sneak peek, um, you can always go to Crayola.com. Um, Crayola, love Crayola, who doesn't love Crayola? And they have tons of free resources for families where you can just click on something, go print something out, you know, and it could be a coloring page. It might even be an art activity, something again, super low stakes that a kid can do in their learning space or even together with their family. Um, and another- can I, can I just say what I loved about Crayola was that yeah. they had things for, from pre, from like toddlers all the way to adults. So they have something for everybody. So I loved exploring Crayola. Well, listen, who doesn't like to do like a mindful coloring page? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. uh, and then the other really cool one is like, you know, we're trying to get out and walk. And I mean, as New Yorkers, I know that my step count, I always joke about this, but has gone down significantly as some I used to just like walk everywhere now to being stuck. So really trying to optimize like walks and walking with kids and like what you can look for or fun activities walk, uh, during your walk along the way, you know, that foster language, that foster bonding. So um, they're really great websites and resources for activities that you can do while you're walking. So, um, you know, exploring the trees right now, it's fall talking about foliage and weather and what you notice doing leaf collection, which, you know, is always really fun to sort by color. Um, so there's lots of resources that we can't wait to get into. Um, we also have some upcoming ones about building the readers who love to read at home. And you know, something that is my specialty that we're really looking forward to is diving into the IEP process. So really getting to know, um, you know, individual learning plans for kids and all of our rights and what you need to know as a parent going into that. So yeah, we're really, really helpful. This journey. really excited about that one. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Cheers. Cheers. Woohoo. Um, and we will see you soon.